We're talking about sexual violence and the work of Safe Connections, next on City Corner. Hi, I'm Sarah Thompson and welcome to City Corner. Over the past several weeks, there's been increased national discussion around sexual violence, the topic of sexual violence due to the testimony of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford during the Supreme Court confirmation hearings of Brett Kavanaugh, Judge Brett Kavanaugh. And so it's been during this time that there's been increased discussion, increased focus on sexual assault survivors. And many of them have been triggered and re-traumatized as a result. In fact, many people have come open about their experiences trending on social media, the hashtag why I didn't report. And so it's under those conditions and today we're gonna talk about sexual violence, talk about its prevalence, some of the national statistics, and even look right here in St. Louis where people can go for support and assistance. And so with that, I'm joined by Jess Cowell. She's with Safe Connections, and Safe Connections is a nonprofit organization that offers hope before, during, and after domestic abuse and sexual violence. And I'm so appreciative, Jess, of you being here today. And I want to make sure your title, you are the Assistant Director of Crisis and Prevention Correct. with Safe Connections. Uh, so thank you again. I know this is a busy time for you. Thank you for being here. We're going to get into all the work and the services that Safe Connections provide, but I kind of wanted to to start the first half of the show really looking at sexual violence and yeah. obviously I started things off talking about the testimony of Dr. Blase Ford. Um, how I think the one thing that came out of this uh, in the past couple weeks is how prevalent this is. You know this, you're an expert mm -hmm. in this field, but really when we're looking around the St. Louis area looking nationally, how prevalent is when we talk about sexual violence and sexual assault? Yeah, it's way more common than we tend to think it is, right? We get statistics like one in six women or one in X amount of men. But what we know about sexual violence, given that hashtag that you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, is that people don't often report sexual violence, right? So when we're looking at numbers, what we know about prevalence is that they're actually probably much higher mm. than what we actually have reported at the end of the day. I pulled some, um, some slides that were from RAIN, Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. Yeah. Um, in fact, this is the one that during the, their hotline, mm -hmm. um, during that Thursday of the hearing, it spiked along the lines of 201% yeah. uptick and increase. And so maybe we can walk through those and if there's any kind of commentary you have to offer that. The first one we're looking at, as you mentioned, every day hundreds of Americans are affected by sexual yeah. violence. Let's clear something up here. With sexual violence, mm -hmm. we hear the terms assault, mm -hmm. harassment. Can you just break down like how they're sort of in the clinical side of things uh, categorized? Yeah, absolutely. So we have broader categories of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, sexual harassment can be anything that is unwanted, repeated. It could be anything from showing somebody a picture of somebody of something that they don't consent to. Um, it could be inappropriate touching. When it gets to touching, it starts to lean into that sexual assault side, right? So unwanted touching, generally thought of it to be sexual assault. Then we get to the far end of the spectrum, which is rape, mm -hmm. right? So unwanted sexual penetration mm -hmm. of somebody. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you for clarifying that, because sure. I know a lot of the times terminology is used interchangeably, yeah. and I think it's clear to, uh, to point that out. Another one we have, every 98 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. Um, and, and to your point, I mean, this could be even a, a shorter period of time, right? Because right. it could be every such and such, like three seconds, 10 seconds, because we just don't really know, but here's uh, one range. I mean, what do you, when you see the statistic, knowing the st statistic in your field, what comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, just heartbreak that it's still happening as often. Mm -hmm. I think a big change with the Me Too movement and everything going on in the national conversation has encouraged people to reach out and talk about this more, and I think that's really important. I work a lot with young people who don't know what consent is or don't know what healthy relationships mm -hmm. look like because we don't have those conversations early on. And I think with the national movement right now and the conversation, that's starting to change. Mm -hmm. So I do feel also really empowered that hopefully we'll get a better picture of what those numbers actually are and we can start to reduce them. Yeah, I think that's an important part, part too, which is like the before, right? Yeah. And I know that that's the work that um, with, with Safe Connections does too, is the before aspect as well. So what is consent? So that we can have young men and women understanding you know, the situation uh, beforehand. Let's look at the number of people victimized each year. Uh, this is another uh, graph that we have. So this kind of looks at ones where it's mm -hmm. children, 
general public, military inmates. Uh, again, can you speak on this, uh, this, this, uh, this slide right here? Yeah, absolutely. So what we know about victims are we usually think of women, mm -hmm. right? But actually, not only are women survivors of sexual assault, but other folks are too, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily talk about men or gender expansive folks. Um, we think about vulnerable populations like the elderly or children. And we know that marginalized folks tend to experience violence and oppression at higher rates. Mm -hmm. And so this is really speaking to that in my oppression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the next one we have too is a breakdown of locations. Um, and I think this is really interesting when I mm -hmm. saw this because 55% at or near the victim's home. Uh, talk about that because then when you mm -hmm. look at an open public place, it's 15%. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when we think about rape particularly, we think of that stranger rape, something that you might see on like Law & Order SVU. However, what we know is that oftentimes sexual assaults are perpetrated by people that that survivor knows, mm -hmm. right? And so that statistic really speaks to the fact that oftentimes folks know the person who is assaulting mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. and that can then lead into the conversation of why people don't report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, and I think that's a good point because just, we, uh, to your point about uh, thinking about it in a movie or a TV episode, it, mm -hmm. it seems like it's a very um, sort of uh, defined situation or moment mm -hmm. that happens when in fact it's not. And what we are seeing, and again, this discussion, is it something of I was sitting on the couch next to my study partner and yeah. this led to this and it, it's not as defined as just that moment that you think it might be as if it were written in a TV script. Right, exactly. Yeah, so let's look at the next one. Uh, nine out of every 10 victims of rape are female. This gets back mm -hmm. to, that, um, uh, to that statistic on the gender side of that. Yeah. That's pretty high and 10% is male. Is there anything you can add to this? Yeah, we definitely see this echoed on our crisis helpline too, similar to the national hotline. We've also seen about a 12 to 15% increase just since Me Too became mm -hmm. a national conversation. And we've had quite an influx of folks identifying as women calling in reporting that they are survivors. Mm -hmm. As recent as just last week with everything happening with the hearings, mm -hmm. people feeling like they can finally come forward and share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Todd, we're gonna get into more of the, the processing, the trauma of it, but how important, I mean, how important is it to when something happens to, to, I mean, to share. Obviously from a mental health perspective, mm -hmm. perspective it's, it's vital. Uh, but talk about that in the sense of that timeline. Should it be immediate? Um, I mean, where do you take that stance mm -hmm. on somebody who has been assaulted? Yeah, for every person it's different, mm -hmm. right? And some people are really encouraged and empowered to report immediately and mm -hmm. get that attention. Some folks need a few minutes, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's maybe a family member or a close friend, they're concerned about different impacting factors, maybe they're at school, and so they just wanna get through finals. Mm -hmm. All of these things really impact somebody's ability to come forward in a way that feels safe and comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. And so really, in the crisis line, we try to be survivor focused, mm -hmm. right? We trust you to be the expert of your experience and we're gonna go at your pace. Mm -hmm. We're just here to provide you options if you mm -hmm. are ready to come forward and mm -hmm. report. Mm -hmm. No, that's good to hear, good to hear. We're gonna go to that next one. Uh, the majority of sexual assault victims are under 30 and that's mm -hmm. a graphic that um, we have here. And again, I think because of college, young people, it's not, um, you know, that first in your 20s, that kind of first dose of a lot of people living yeah. on their own, maybe living with friends, it's not. Um, terribly shocking, but maybe you could speak to this as it relates to Safe Connections and the work that you do. Is this kind of follow the same pattern of a lot of the people in the community that you assist? It really does. This is really a statistic that we see echoed in our own statistics on our crisis line as well. Generally, this is the age group of folks who are reaching out for support. Mm -hmm. And so we can definitely echo that. And again, it's the first time that some people are going to college campuses or maybe even just living on their own. Mm -hmm. And so they have that autonomy and maybe they're being exposed to substances for the first time. And so really, I think it all goes back to those conversations early on being mm -hmm. so important about what does consent look like, feel like, sound like, mm -hmm. and how can we talk about healthy relationships? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let's move to the next one too, which is one in six American women. And this kind of, we've already gotten on this area, but this is really with um, mm -hmm. rape. This is pretty shocking. One out of every six American women has been the victim of an attempted or completed rape in yeah. her lifetime. I mean, it's just, it's frightening. Um, it's heartbreaking. Uh, and I, again, it's so much too, some things that you have alluded to is even in the reporting of statistics, what's hard is it kind of puts the agency so much time on in this case, women. Yeah. It makes it feel like it's their ownership. How do you feel that we can equally make that part for the person who is the perpetrator? 
Yeah, I think just by having these conversations mm -hmm. is the best step to start moving in that direction. And I think we are moving in that direction a bit more so than we have, at least in my experience mm -hmm. in this field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's good. Um, let's again go back to this. this is going to be a college age statistic. We're going to look at two of them. This is the one in every six. The next one is college women are mm -hmm. at risk. And um, I mean, I can even speak to myself when I was in college, just when you're out and yeah. you're on your own, it's that first dose of freedom and those boundaries mm -hmm are blurred pretty much every day and you're not mm -hmm. sure of what you will tolerate on the harassment side um, and what you will put up with, who yeah. you can tell, who you can trust. What can we do to, because the next graphic we're gonna look at too is also with men. This happens with men as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, let's look at that graphic next with college age, male college students at risk as well. And that's five times um, non-students at that mm -hmm. same age. When you're looking at college students, I'm sure, as you mentioned, a lot of the calls that you get, what is something, what, what makes that college environment so unique that ha creates that sort of uptick and that increase? Yeah, I, people are really looking to forge relationships and friendships with new and different people, right? And so they're maybe a little bit more lenient on what their boundaries are as they're starting to make friends, right? Like, I want you to like me. I want us to get along so that we can potentially be support systems for each other mm -hmm. throughout this experience that is college, mm -hmm. right? So I think that definitely plays a really big part in it of really just navigating what are my personal boundaries and what am I and am I not okay with, I think is an important conversation for every college student to have just as they're going onto campus and to check back in with. Mm -hmm. And do you recommend too on the prevention side, that before side, with parents talking with, mm -hmm. what age do you think parents should really sit down with their kids and, and talk about that, both with sons and daughters, about those their boundaries? Yeah, I think it can start as early as that parent is comfortable with. We really talk about not just relationships romantically, but what about just friendships, mm -hmm. right? How can we talk about consent with two people in a friendship mm -hmm. as kind of that base level? And I think you can go pretty early on with that. Mm -hmm. When we're thinking about intimate relationships or romantic partnerships, I think that comes a little bit later. We tend to start that programming around that fifth, sixth grade level mm -hmm. um, and really just keeping it open of, what does communication look like mm -hmm. between a partner? How can you communicate what your boundaries are to mm -hmm. that partner? How do we even think about what those boundaries are for right. ourselves first, mm -hmm. right? And I think parents can definitely do that as young as they feel comfortable mm -hmm. around friendships and or relationships. Right. No, it's really interesting because with young children, we talk about personal space, respecting personal space, yeah. but somewhere along the line that gets very blurry and gets fuzzy and that sort of mm -hmm. um, having, you know, sort of autonomy and control over your, your personal space gets yeah. a little bit lost. I do want to bring up, this is going to be an image of the hashtag why I didn't report. Mm -hmm. There's two things that we're going to look at. Uh, the first one there we've got was the Twitter that just went I mean that was just trending yeah. nonstop the next one is actually an artwork that I found uh, from James Madison University's student-run newspaper called the breeze and this is artwork by Kat Ellis and what stood out to me about this was sort of all the reasons why I didn't um, report and so I, I, what stood out to me about here you have no proof were you drunk you know did you scream you know, when you're talking to uh, survivors and, and they say, I couldn't come forward because I felt like it was my fault, yeah. what, is, what is your response to that? Because I want people hearing this to know that, like, that moment of it's not your fault whether you mm -hmm. wore something that might have been risque or anything different. What do you, how do we, again, shift that conversation so that, it, that women don't feel responsible for something that has happened to them? Yeah, first I wanna say you're not alone if you're having that feeling, right? Working on the crisis line, we hear this constantly of, well, there's something that I could have done maybe, or if I had just said this, or I didn't wear this, or maybe I didn't communicate my boundaries as clearly mm -hmm. enough, so you're not alone. But also, nobody has the right to violate you, mm -hmm. right? You have the right to your body and you have the right to respect from your partner and or partners, and so, it's not okay what happened to you, and I'm so sorry that happened to you, mm -hmm. is what I would tell somebody coming forward with that statement. Okay, well, we're gonna take a quick break. Before we do, we're gonna put the information on the screen for you to reach out to Safe Connections. There's two graphics that we have. One is their 24-hour crisis helpline. If you have had anything, any experiences that you wanna share, you can call that number, and then here's also their information. You can go to safeconnections.com. But we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more from Safe Connections right after this. We here at STL TV want to connect with you as we bring up to date information going on in your city. Whether it's events with the mayor, sports, music, and even spotlights on regional organizations, we're here to bring you the 411. 
You can keep current with STL TV and its shows by following us on Facebook at STL TV and both Twitter and Instagram at STL TV channel. What are you waiting for, St. Louis? Get connected and in the know today. There are so many reasons to love St. Louis, you can't pick just one. What I love about St. Louis is the 79 unique neighborhoods and 108 beautiful city parks, including Forest Park, which is actually larger than Central Park in New York, and the gorgeous Tower Grove Park right here. And there's always something new to experience, no matter the time of day or the season. So come and experience St. Louis. Oh. Have you seen that piece, piece on the Tiffany neighborhood on STL TV? No. Let me show you. My wife and I were looking for homes, we lived in the city all of her life, and there's just a, a different energy when you're in, in the city. Keep up with what's happening in your neighborhood. Watch STL TV. Be in the know. Hi, I'm Sarah Thompson and welcome back to City Corner. Today we're talking about the topic of sexual violence and we're doing that with Safe Connections with Jess Cowell. She is the Assistant Director of Crisis and Prevention with Safe Connections. And I wanted to dedicate this segment and this half of the show in looking at the work that Safe Connections uh, does. And thank you for your expertise during that first segment. Uh, I didn't get a chance to, in the first segment, to go to this graphic, and I do want to pull it up. It's uh, the Time Magazine cover mm -hmm. of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. And what's important, besides the artwork, this was um, with this artwork that was done by John Mavridis, um, I think what's important about it, besides her words being sort of etched into it too, is the title of the, the piece is Her Lasting Impact. And I was curious what you think and what you've seen specifically um, with the hotline and just the calls that you've been getting at Safe Connections, what you think the past few weeks has sort of shifted or changed in the world of when we get into sort of domestic abuse and sexual violence of, of survivors feeling comfortable or more empowered to speak mm -hmm. out. Yeah, definitely with the broader Me Too movement, we've seen that surge in calls. We've been up about 12 to 15% on our crisis line. But in addition to that, just over the course of the past week and a half alone, we've seen more and more folks who are identifying as older folks telling us their survivor stories from when they were younger, right? When maybe they were stuck in that mindset of thinking there was something I could have done or I was too young to know what was happening, and being able to feel empowered enough to share that with somebody else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let's, uh, and let's, this is a great way to segue into with what Safe Connections does, because we keep referring to the hotline, and I mm -hmm. think there's an interesting story here, because the hotline, which you get calls 24 hours, yeah. is the starting point for the organization, is that correct? It is, it is. Safe Connections was actually founded over 40 years ago by four social workers, actually from the Brown School at WashU, yeah. um, who saw this need in the community and came together to find that solution. So they started the crisis line, it's still the same number today, um, and answering calls from survivors in the community who are needing support, particularly around domestic or sexual violence. So it started off just as a hotline, mm -hmm. and so now it's grown into a full-fledged nonprofit organization. Yeah. Let's talk about the different programs and services, because um, I, October is Domestic uh, Abuse Awareness Month, is that uh -huh. correct, or Domestic Violence uh, Awareness Month? And I know we are, have been focusing so much on sexual violence, but yeah. your Safe Connections kind of covers an array of services, and maybe you can kind of walk us through that. Maybe we'll start with the before part, yeah. because I know we say offering hope before, during, and after domestic abuse and se sexual violence. Let's focus on the before part. What do you do in that area? Yeah, for before, Safe Connections is really big on prevention. Okay. How can we create the opportunity for folks to not even need to have our services in a reactionary way? So what that looks like is that we have programming in high schools, middle schools, detention centers, residential facilities, pretty much anywhere that you would hope to find a young person, we mm -hmm. really try to be. We're talking to them about sexual violence, we're talking to them about consent, healthy relationships. We're trying to give them the tools that they would need to hopefully protect themselves and feel empowered in that knowledge later on in their lives. Okay, and I think we have, I mean, I, we've got a couple photos, I think that range from one photo from um, just some of your public community outreach efforts. Yeah. And I think another that might actually refer to that program. When you're in schools, is this something that teachers or uh, sort of counselors at schools can reach directly out to you and say, please come and talk to our 
class of juniors or seniors mm -hmm. about this? Or how does that sort of work? Uh, is it just schools or is it even just private appointments? How does that work? Yeah, oftentimes we'll have site contacts who are reaching out to us. Say, for example, something happened in school and they're needing education around sexual harassment. That's been our most popular workshop in our Project Heart series um, just over the course of the past year with the Me Too movement. So they're more than welcome to reach out to us. Um, you can find our contact information at safeconnections.org. And we would love to be in the schools talking to your young people. Okay, so that's kind of the before aspect, which I think is really important because you have then a team of people who are really focusing on the prevention side of this. Yeah. The hope is that the prevention side. And then when we say offering hope during, let's talk about that during, which is mm -hmm. we wish didn't happen, but it does. And so talk about that. Is that just the hotline or is it a whole other series, uh, you know, array of, of services as well? Oftentimes it really is that crisis department. However, we have student disclosures when we're in schools talking to folks about healthy relationships. And we also have folks who are walk-ins who show up to Safe Connections needing support now. Hmm. Um, a lot of our clients that we see in clinical, it's a very recent experience. And so we're still kind of in that during, during that time too, of mm -hmm. making sure that we can have you be safe and receiving services from us too. I think this area, it's important to talk about privacy and maybe somebody hearing this who might be on the fence about calling yeah. or coming in how do you manage that because they might think what if i'm recognized what if somebody knows me i don't want somebody mm -hmm. to know this yet how do you handle that both on the hotline as well as for any walk-ins that might show up confidentiality is of the utmost important importance for us, just given the severity of the trauma that often our folks are coming in with. And so on our crisis helpline, we're often not asking identifying information. The only caveat to that is that if there is disclosure of abuse toward a child um, or an elderly or disabled person, that is something that we would have to report in addition mm -hmm. to like suicide or homicidal feelings. However, we're not going to ask names. We're not going to ask addresses when somebody's coming forward with their survivor story. Mm -hmm. We really want that to be an opportunity for that person to feel safe in mm -hmm. sharing and to have access to options for what they could do as a next step. And how do you handle the element of law enforcement, right? Because someone, many people mm -hmm. who are calling you, a crime has been committed. Mm -hmm. uh, where does that, on the side of, again, if somebody's walking um, a walk-in, or if someone is calling that hotline or emailing you, and it's clear that it's a crime that's happened, how, does, how is that handled? Yeah, so again, if it's not a minor, there's mm -hmm. nothing that we can do as okay. an organization to report that. However, we do empower our survivors with that option to move forward with making a report through law enforcement. Sometimes that's a really great fit for them, sometimes mm -hmm. it's not, um, but we're gonna try and set them up for success either way. So if it is, great, let's talk about advocacy support that might be in law enforcement centers so that you can have somebody with you to help okay. that sense of safety. Mm -hmm. um, if not, let's talk about safety planning. How can we keep you safe so that this doesn't have the opportunity to happen again and or you're not having to be re-triggered by mm -hmm. seeing somebody. Mm, that's, no, that's excellent information and that's good to know. And then we kind of shift to the after. Mm -hmm. um, and you and I were saying during the break that once something like this has happened, it's, it's in you, it never goes away. You can't mm -hmm. forget it. You um, will, it will always be with you. And so it's a matter of living with trauma. Yeah. Um, so t talk about that. Talk about um, safe connections and, and the after phase of when that violent act might have occurred. Yeah, so that is very much the reason for our counseling programming. We provide counseling for folks over the age of 13, any gender, any sexual identity, who's experienced domestic violence, sexual violence, or bullying and harassment based on their gender identity. And so we try to be that welcoming space, knowing that healing is often not linear. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have time-sensitive counseling. It's not a year and you're out. It's not a certain amount of sessions and you're out. It's really how can we be with you and support you through your journey mm -hmm. toward healing. Mm -hmm. And so our, our a lot of individuals that you work with, you mentioned people calling when um, trauma has happened decades in the past. Mm -hmm. Do people stay with your services kind of checking in and out or is it more of meaning um, managed care, if you will? Mm -hmm. um, or is it more of we're gonna get you through this phase and then we can refer you to other services? Yeah, so we do graduate folks from our program. Um, however, like I said, healing's not linear and so sometimes something will happen to trigger those emotions again and somebody will need kind of that longer term support mm -hmm. that we might provide. So we do have clients who do come back for services maybe after they've graduated at some point or through a transition, um, but oftentimes folks are coming in getting that support and then we're able to connect them with additional community resources for that next step, whether that's housing or employment or whatever the case may be. Okay, I know I alluded to just a, a few minutes ago about October being uh, domestic 
uh, Abuse Awareness Month, and I think I have a graphic so I can get this actually accurate in, <laughs> uh, in my wording here. So here we go, Domestic Violence, yeah. I should say, Awareness Month, so I apologize um, about that. What is it the same types of services when it comes to domestic violence or is something um, different? Because this is a really tricky one, too, because obviously mm -hmm. this involves families. This involves yeah. um, couples together. Mm -hmm. And it's this is really scary when you get into and another reason why I didn't report. There's always the hashtag why, why I chose to stay, why I had to stay. Right. And this gets really complicated. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit more about this specific area as well. Yeah, what we know is that we see a lot of overlap between domestic violence and sexual violence. Oftentimes, sexual violence is a use of power and control that an abuser will use over their partner in that domestic violence relationship. Mm -hmm. And so there is a ton of overlap between the two, and we just try to provide support for where that person's at. So if they're experiencing sexual violence, we're happy to provide that added lens of support. And sometimes maybe it's just financial abuse or psychological abuse, mm -hmm. which isn't to... Um, minimize that at all. What we know is that oftentimes that physical piece um, doesn't leave mm -hmm. as many marks as that psychological piece or that mm -hmm. sexual violence piece can. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we are really just dedicated to meeting people where they're at regardless of what that history is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. And we're going to now talk about, obviously, that you were talking about just the increase in, um, in calls that you're getting and the work that you're doing. And again, I appreciate your time for yeah. being here because I know you're busy. That then leads to support for the organization itself. You mm -hmm. have a fundraiser coming up um, called the Lotus Ball. And I think we've got the sort of invitation cover for that. Tell me about this. Yeah. Yeah, the Lotus Ball is coming up. It's kind of our annual benefit. It's get glitzed and glammed up and come celebrate with us and think about fundraising efforts for preventing mm -hmm. and reacting to domestic violence that you're seeing. This year we actually have our prevention education manager speaking and oh, I get to talk to her every day and I just can't wait to hear what she's got to say <laughs> that night too. Do you know what she's going to say? Is, it, is that part of the evening? Is it like a, it's, you're saying it's a prepared mm -hmm. speech? Yeah, so she's going to be our keynote speaker and so she's really going to be able to speak to what it's like to be in the classroom, particularly with our girls groups and how um, that impact really shows up in this work. Mm -hmm. and how is it for you? I mean, in this line of work, I say this because I have, you know, I, people that I know that are very close who are social workers, uh, who work in the, you know, world of psychology and therapy, and to hear these stories, I mean, mm -hmm. your awareness level is very is peaked, is heightened. But how is it for you? I mean, you are passionate about what you're doing, and uh, but talk a bit more about your role, um, especially because it's on the crisis side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. You know, I, to be in this work, you have to have great compartmentalization, mm -hmm. right? You hear really traumatic, really heavy things. And it's also incredibly empowering. Mm -hmm. It's a really empowering feeling to be able to offer somebody options when they feel like they don't have anything. Mm -hmm. There's something really beautiful about that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's always a balance, and I'm sure mm -hmm. that's going to continue, especially with everything going on in the national conversation right now. Mm -hmm. And what do you, when you get to that, that realization, too, I, it's such a, a poignant way of stating that, too, because you sort of realize um, power and strength in, in the time of helping people. And where do you sort of see hope? Is it when you see um, individuals that you've worked with really just be empowered and sort of you see the shift and the change mm -hmm. in them over time? Is that kind of what drives your hope each day? Absolutely. I think when you see those light bulb moments in the classroom, when students are really getting and really getting excited about consent mm -hmm. and the idea of wanting to have a healthy relationship, that's definitely a passion moment. When you're seeing an increase of number of calls on the line, that's a passion moment, right? Mm -hmm. Of people feeling safe enough to reach out for support. That's huge. Yes. Well, I appreciate your time being yeah. here today, and I hope everyone at home that you've learned something here today on the show. We've got the information there for you to reach out to Safe Connections. That's their 24-hour crisis helpline, 314-531-2003. Also, for their website information, I do want to make a correction from the first part. It is safeconnections.org. We uh, incorrectly stated that as .com in the first segment, but safeconnections.org. That's the office number and their location right there off Hampton Avenue, 2165 Hampton Avenue. Safe Connections offering hope before, during, during and after domestic abuse and sexual violence. And thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time and for sharing the information with us today. Thanks. And thank you at home for watching and keep it right here on STL TV, Experience St. Louis.